Hello and welcome to the first ever One Stop English podcast. Each month, we bring together teachers, editors, and experts to discuss what's going on in the world of ELT. I'm your host, Sam Wadsworth. I'm a former teacher and current editor here at Macmillan. Joining me this month are Patrick Curry, Delta qualified teacher and editor on One Stop English. Hi there. Becca Sanderson, former teacher and editor of numerous business and general English titles. Hello. And Rob Hughes, Delta qualified teacher currently studying for a master's in applied linguistics. Hello. This month we'll be discussing native versus non native teachers, Brexit and its effects on ELT, modern perceptions of the ELT teacher, and formal, informal, and non formal learning. We also have an interview with Mike Riley, teacher engagement manager here at Macmillan. Right, let's get started. Patrick, what can you tell us about the native? Versus non native debate? Okay, well, this is not a new discussion. Uh, it goes all the way back to the early 80s. But recently it was brought into the spotlight by Sylvana Richardson at IATEFL. She uh, did a very rousing plenary about the subject. Some of the bare facts are that uh, approximately 90% of English teachers worldwide are actually non native speakers. However, uh, up to 70%, maybe more, of job adverts um, ask for native speaking teachers. Now, why is this? I think the assumption is that if you're a native speaker of a language, then you are, you have a more, you have a, a, a wider knowledge mm. of that language, which right, is absolutely. not necessarily true at all. That you're inherently better. That exactly. seems to be the and you know all the the nuances and all the yeah. little bits and bobs. Recruiters and schools, for example, uh, prefer native speaking teachers. Um, parents apparently ask for them, and um, mm. according to some sources, students prefer native speaking teachers. Though this is probably more debatable. But obviously there are consequences to this. Uh, what are the consequences? Mainly non-natives having difficulty finding work in their own country and abroad. Mm -hmm. Another consequence is non-natives have been asked to pretend to be native-speaking teachers. And this creates a chasm between perceived good teachers who are native mm -hmm. and then the rest of the teachers, the non-natives, who make up the 90%. Mm -hmm. But sorry, they have to pretend to be... A native speaker, so they what they put on an accent. Or they put on an accent, absolutely, because parents will pay more if they have a native speaking teacher That's teaching odd, their children, isn't it? That's pretty odd, because surely th then their accent is wrong, or what know, is their very accent? Strange, right, it would be a very strange pronunciation of mm. the words, and but also that there's a very wide variation in accent, you know, between native speakers, and there's no one mm. agreed way to speak. There's you no know, correct even, accent, you know, right? even yeah. even in a place like London or in the UK, there's no agreed way to speak or to say something. So it seems like this is a dichotomy that is just completely wrong, mm -hmm. that we should be maybe moving away from the idea of uh, native speakers and kind of move that into a perception of expert speakers. Absolutely. Yeah. That would include non-natives as well. Yes, yeah, so the same knowledge, same level of teaching ability. It's more about the ability, about the knowledge, is not where you're from. Right. Yeah, it's just about your qualification and if you've, you've got that qualification, then that's surely enough. Well, qualifications are important because a lot of non-native teachers, before they even become language teachers, they have the experience of learning the language and they do a qualification in their country, which allows them to teach. Um, and they're arguably more qualified than a newly qualified CELTA teacher. So many native speakers, as it were, are monolingual speakers, whereas you're teaching someone to be bilingual. Surely you need a bilingual speaker to be more effective at that. Mm, definitely. And of course, they've had the experience of learning a language. And so they can sympathise with their students' issues, which is another advantage. Absolutely. So you've had so much more classroom time going into the, the course, so into the CELTA, um, than a lot of native speakers, right? So you've had all of that exposure in class learning a language yourself. So I, I don't think there's a necessarily an answer we have to this debate, but there has been an a organisation set up to try and deal with this kind of inequality, which is the, uh, the TEFL Equity Advocates. They were set up in 2014 to address the issue of equal professional opportunities in ELT. And on their website, they have a list of schools around the world who provide equal opportunities for both native and non-natives. OK. All right, let's move on. Becca, I understand that Brexit might have inadvertently settled the native versus non-native debate in Europe. Yes, indeed. Well, it happened back in June, but it's still big news over here in the UK. So there was a referendum and 52% of British voters opted to leave the EU. So the British exit or Brexit is going ahead. So what impact will it have on ELT? Well, according to a statistics report 
in 2015 by English UK, which is the Association of Accredited English Language Centres, more than 60% of the 535,000 students who come to language schools in the UK every year are from EU member states, and more than 25,000 jobs are supported by ELT across the UK. Uh, in terms of the impact of Brexit on ELT, well, it all depends, really, whether it's a soft Brexit or a hard Brexit or somewhere in between. What's the difference between a soft or a hard Brexit? Well, if it's a soft Brexit and the UK remains in the single market, like, say, Norway or Switzerland, and there's still freedom of movement, it could be that there aren't so many dramatic changes. But if it's a hard Brexit and there's no freedom of movement, um, there'll be a lot more bureaucracy like uh, visa issues, uh, more paperwork for agencies. So this kind of thing could have a huge effect on language schools in the UK. So fewer students, uh, decreased revenues, possible wage cuts, possible job losses. But uh, what about UK nationals who want to teach in the, in the EU mm. um, or, or who are currently teaching in the EU? Yeah, well, you're going to meet some obstacles because, again, it's back to that freedom of movement thing. So British teachers won't have the automatic right to work there and schools in the EU will have to give priority to EU citizens when it comes to recruiting. Really? OK, mm. so what, what are your options? If I want to work there, do I have to marry someone in well, the EU? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a way and uh, possibly applying for citizenship. Or if you are 17 to 30, you can apply for a temporary working holiday visa. Right. Um, so these are two massive topics um, and we don't have enough time to talk about everything, uh, but we think it's an important conversation to have. So listeners, we need your feedback. Have you experienced prejudice as a non-native teacher? Has your school been affected by Brexit? Email your comments to one stop podcast at macmillan.com. OK, next up, we've got Warmer of the Month. Each month, we challenge our guest teacher to explain a fun, communicative activity in no more than five steps. So, Rob, what have you got for us? OK, well, I've got a little twist on the uh, using pictures to introduce a reading text or a listening text or whatever you want, really. So you have to divide your students into A's and B's in partners. So Becca's going to be A. OK. Patrick, you're going to be B. OK. What we get you to do, so you have to have an IWB, and you will put a picture on the IWB. Patrick, you have to close your eyes. For and the listeners at home, Patrick, I can confirm, has closed his eyes. Uh -huh. And so, Becca, <laughs> this is your picture. You just look at the picture, okay. and you flash it up for a few moments. Can like I see this. the picture? Yes, there you go. All right. Okay. And now, Pat. Hello. You need to open your eyes. Becca, you close your eyes. Mm -hmm. This is the second picture. Okay. OK, and now you have to discuss, tell each other what you saw and what is the connection between the two pictures. Ooh, OK, should I go first? Please do. OK, so um, it was a street, looked like maybe um, a city in Asia or something, and there were about three, four people um, carrying shopping bags, red plastic shopping bags, um, all walking in the same direction across the street. OK, I saw a picture of a surfer who was surfing... Yeah. And on the wave, it's kind of a tunnel of a wave, there was a lot of trash floating Ooh, in the okay. wave. Yeah. So uh, maybe it's rubbish. It's uh, Recycling, rubbish, yeah. pollution, something something along those lines. Is that the connection? Exactly, you're hey. right. So oh, oh, nice. you can show the pictures again. Was it exactly how you thought? Like that. Oh, that nice. the other one. Yep. So this ties in nicely with One Stop English's reading about plastic and plastic bags, which you can find on the website. Excellent. Perfect. Thanks, Thank Rob. you. Thank you very much. OK, let's move on. It's now time for Word of the Month. Each month we discuss a piece of ELT jargon and how it affects teachers. So, Patrick, why should we care about formal, informal and non-formal learning? OK, well, we should care about it because it's to do with professional development, first and foremost. Formal learning is to do with qualifications which you take in a recognised institution. For example, a Delta. Rob, I believe you have a Delta? Yep, that's right. So you have a formal qualification. Mm -hmm. Yep. However, how was your Delta? It was great. Loved it. Was it tough? It was quite hard, yes. It was a lot of work. 
okay. especially because you have a full-time job at the same time. So Absolutely. So not everyone can afford the time to do a Delta. So what else do we have? What are the other options? The other options are informal and non-formal learning. So non-formal learning is the type of professional development you do in your school with training seminars. So you might give a training session to your colleagues or you might have someone outside the school come in and give your teachers a training session. That would be non-formal learning. Okay. Informal learning is when you learn day to day through your teaching practice. You keep a record of your teaching, much like we encourage our students to keep records of their learning. This is teachers keeping records of their teaching. So what do you do? What do you actually write? Well, it's a lot of reflective practice. So if you teach a particular skill and something goes very well, you would make a note of that and then next time you'd use the same thing. Conversely, if you taught something and it wasn't so successful, you would make a note on how it could be improved. And of course, then you could share this with your colleagues and that would come mm. back into non-formal learning. Right. So it's so, a bit more awareness of what you're doing. It's reflective, it's mm. awareness, and it's to do with uh, professional development, which is obviously very important if you want to improve as a teacher mm -hmm. and uh, which will obviously have effects on your students. So there's the word of the month, formal, non-formal, and informal learning. All right, thanks very much, Patrick. Um, let's move on to this month's interview. Each month we interview an ELT professional, and this month Patrick spoke to our very own Mike Riley. So, Mike, uh, how are you today? I'm very well, thank you. Very excited to be here, a guest on your new podcast. Excellent, good to hear. Um, so, to begin with, can you tell me uh, a little bit about what you do? Yes, I'm the Teacher Engagement Manager here at Macmillan Education. So, I'm part of the Teacher Professional Development Team. And my job is all about training teachers and helping teachers develop. Okay, and what did you do before you started at Macmillan? Uh, well, I used to work and live in Italy, in Milan, so I think I took um, a fairly typical route. I moved there many years ago as an um, EFL teacher, thought I would stay there a year, maybe two years, and then I left at the end of last year after 15 years in Italy. So. I worked as a teacher then as director of studies and for the last few years I was um, director of a private language school in the centre of Milan. Excellent, very interesting. And in those 15 years, yeah. starting as teacher and ending up as uh, director of studies, how do you feel the role of teacher changed? Um, well, there have been loads of changes in teaching. Perhaps one of the biggest changes that we saw in Milan was this, and I'm sure um, many of your, your listeners can uh, agree with this, that uh, we moved from being a virtually 100% adult school to increasing numbers of kids every, every year, till it was, uh, when I left it, was the, the majority of the students were young learners. So that was a considerable shift, especially as most teachers had done their, their initial training in teaching adults. I think technology has changed a lot, so when I first moved there I was still taking the cassettes out the bag and carrying my um, cassette player around to various companies and 15 years later everybody had iPads, we were all hooked up to uh, flat screen TVs. I think when I moved to Italy the word podcast probably didn't even exist and here I am being interviewed on the podcast, so lots have changed. Having said that, I'm not sure the role of teacher has fundamentally changed. I think the teacher is still there to help students learn. So some of the tools have changed, um, perhaps uh, the makeup of the actual students have changed, but the job of teacher I think is fundamentally the same as it was 15 years ago. Absolutely, so the role remains fundamentally the same. Uh, recently in ELT, though, there's been a big debate about uh, the origins of teachers, um, specifically native teachers versus non-natives, and I understand when you were in Italy, uh, this was something you were involved in changing and bringing forward. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, um, so when I started teaching in Italy, it was a fairly big school, and I would say the vast majority of the English teachers were native 
teachers, most of them, like myself, over from England, often on uh, you know, fairly short-term contracts, perhaps they'd be there for a year, two, three years. When I became Director of Studies, I made the decision to open up the recruitment procedure to non-natives as well as natives. I think the pressure previously had been the kind of sales and marketing um, pressure of saying to your students, we've got only native teachers. What I felt was the best thing for our school was that what we wanted to be saying is that we had the best teachers. Not just um, teachers who spoke the language as a first language, but teachers who were qualified despite their yeah. origins. Yeah, so well, I mean all the teachers we took on were qualified, but I think we were missing out on a lot of talented teachers by focusing only on native teachers. Um, there, there was a bit of resistance from the students when we first uh, brought the non-native teachers through, but I have to say the feedback at the end of the courses was overwhelmingly positive, and, and perhaps later we can talk about why that might be and what mm. some of the advantages are of a non-native teacher over a native Absolutely. teacher. I'm, I'm quite proud of the fact that when I left the school it was probably a 50-50 uh, percent mix in the in the teachers' room of, of native and non-native teachers. Yeah, very much so. Very much so. I, I guess one thing would be that the students respect people who've gone through the same journey they went. They're going through themselves, so they would understand the teachers who are teaching them, who are from Italy in your case, uh, would have learned English and would understand the difficulties and the problems that they would have. Uh, yes, I think that's true. I think they also respect the native teachers for other reasons, perhaps for the culture they bring mm -hmm. into the, the, the classroom and maybe the life experiences. I think, looking at it for, uh, for a second from the other point of view, I think the teacher is often better able to understand the struggles that the students are going through. Mm -hmm. uh, on a very simple fundamental level, especially with newly qualified teachers, they already understand the way the language works and the grammar because they've had to study it and learn it themselves. Absolutely. I, I remember, for example, when I qualified, the biggest challenge for me in the first two years was, was actually understanding the grammar that I was teaching. Mm. So I think there's a kind of a, 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 an advantage that they might have in terms of knowledge. I also think there's an interesting career path of people who are non-natives. Uh, often natives are going abroad to experience another culture, uh, in my case for the football and the pizza that was available in Italy at the time, but what we noticed with non-native teachers, it's been their lifelong passion to teach English. Mm -hmm. So perhaps from when they were kids they wanted um, to teach this language and I think um, you'll know and your listeners will know that having a, a really motivated, passionate teacher can make all the difference. I want to be clear, there are plenty of passionate uh, native um, teachers as well and um, I think that would be my conclusion, it's all about the quality of the teacher and yeah. their understanding of the students and their passion for the job, mm -hmm. regardless of whether they're native or non-native. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's move on and uh, talk about the future of ELT and if you could make one key change to the world of ELT uh, from the perspective of either a director of studies or your current role teacher engagement manager or even going back to when you were a teacher, looking forward, what change would you like to see uh, take place in the world of ELT? Uh, wow, that's a big question. That's a, um, I think uh, despite all of the technology that's coming um, and we keep seeing articles about adaptive learning and the role of um, mobile technology in the classroom. I still think that the teacher is fundamental to the, the, the success mm -hmm. of the language learning experience. So I would love to see uh, in the future a shift in the perception of the role of the ELT teacher. I think Perhaps in the past, people have viewed it as a, 
a poor relation to real teaching, to mm -hmm. teaching mm -hmm. in state schools, secondary schools, uh, universities, um, and I would I would love to imagine that in ten years' time the the world of ELT and ELT teaching is considered as highly as other branches of education that teachers are treated very well and and. I'm sure this will be done well with your listeners, but paid very well, <laughs> and yeah. uh, that the, 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 the role of teacher has a much higher status. Absolutely. I suppose the key question is how to, how to bring about that change, whether it's through more immersive training, moving with the technology of the time, but um, looking at key issues like classroom management, learner management, um, planning, making sure qualified teachers are rigorously tested. So when they, when they enter their careers, they're looked upon as proper teachers rather than kind of a fly-by-night um, stepping stone career, yeah. as it were. Um, I, I, I think this whole idea of continuous professional um, development is crucial mm -hmm. um, to, to lifting the status of the EFL, EFL teacher. Sadly, in many realities, um, a teacher is hired, put into a classroom, and then they're never trained, never observed, left to their own devices uh, for years. So I think and stand that causes stands to drop somewhat, or stagnate, or mm -hmm. you know that the, the, I think if you're going to turn around to the wider world and say we are dedicated professionals, then they're going to be asking questions like, well, what do you do to keep learning? What do you do to keep developing? Which is where we come in, of course where you come in for sure. Hopefully. Brilliant. Well, it's been a pleasure chatting to you. Thank you very much Thank for your you. time. And uh, best of luck with teacher development. Thank you. Good luck with the podcast. Thank you very much. All right. Um, lots of interesting ideas in that interview. Um, one of the things that Mike talked about was a need for a shift in the perception of the EFL teacher. Do you guys think that people look down on English language teachers? And if so, what can we do about this? Well, I think there's a general perception that if you're a ELT teacher, it's perhaps more of a temporary situation, you know, a means to travel and have a, a big life experience, which it is. And, and that's that is, okay, isn't it? That's a good valid. thing to do. Yeah, yeah. But, but perhaps you're not in it for the long haul. Um, I think one thing we can do to change it is look at ways of developing professionally. So you move forward in your career and you take on new skills, you learn new new techniques. And you can certainly um, take on more, uh, you know, difficult classes, more challenging classes, you know, for example, teaching English for specific purposes, like for uh, undergraduates or for pre-sessional courses. But that might help you change your perception of, of yourself as a teacher. But how do we change? I think the question is more mm. about how do we change other people mm. outside our world? How do we make them um, change their perceptions? By taking it more seriously and knowing what you're doing, you know, and becoming more expert at, in your field. Mm -hmm. And you can challenge those perceptions. OK, the next section is called Teacher's Dilemma. Each month we describe a common classroom issue and ask our listeners to send in solutions. Becca, what have you got for us this month? OK, so here's the problem. Your school has a policy that any student arriving more than 10 minutes late for class won't be allowed in. However, three or four students in your class consistently turn up late. When you tell them they can't come in, they get really angry. What should you do? Well, I think the first thing that you have to do is kind of diffuse the situation. I mean, you can't really have adult students getting angry at you, you know, in a corridor screaming and shouting. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're just the teacher in that situation, you do have to get you know, somebody else involved if you cannot diffuse it yourself. So what, I mean, the principal of the calm. school or Yeah, exactly. I mean, studies. firstly, though, I mean, you should explain that that's the school policy. Mm -hmm. Explain why they have it, presumably to avoid disrupting the class, mm -hmm. to avoid disrupting the other students because yeah. they've turned up on time. Mm -hmm. Why should they just be allowed to swan in mm. 10 minutes late? So, OK, and how strict are you, Rob, in your classes these days? <laughs> how, how late could I turn up for your class and still get in? Well, considering I, I'm teaching sort of university students who really are very motivated, they're all there before me, to be honest now. But uh, I think that it really depended on the age. Uh, when I was teaching teenagers, uh, I was very strict. 
Mm, They definitely could not turn up late to my classes. Adults, though, you know, sometimes they have work. There are other reasons why they're late. They've got family things. So I'm very much, you know, they're paying the money. They can come in. Depends on the school policy, obviously. OK, listeners, over to you. How would you solve this problem? Send your solutions to this month's dilemma to one stop podcast at macmillan.com. All right, and it's time for our final section this month. It's Q&A, the part of the show in which we try to answer your questions. As this is the first show, we've taken this month's questions from the One Stop English website. So our first question this month is about vocabulary. The writer asks, how can I help my students with collocations? Should they only be taught at advanced level? Rob, as our uh, teacher this month, what do you think? Well, um, I would definitely disagree with this. I think that you should be teaching collocation from day one. Absolutely. I really think that, you know, I mean, even a a good morning is a collocation, I mean, Mm. which most students can say before they even start. But, uh, you know, you need to be going with the, you know, the the verbs like do and make, be. They all have very common everyday collocations. I think it's really, really essential. Okay, so would you suggest having maybe a page in your student's notebook that is do and then like a mind map and you have kind of possible collocations or that kind of thing? What? Certainly that's one way to do it. Yeah, there are many ways. I mean, maybe it depends on how the students learn, you know, maybe they want to um, write it on post-its and have it around their house or something like that. Yeah, definitely the post-its and, you know, like Pictionary or charades or something like that for more of a fun thing. But the advanced learners, that's kind of interesting, but I don't see why um, they can't do games and fun things too. Absolutely. Okay, question number two. I've got a great idea for a lesson that I want to get published. Can I send it to you? Yes, you can. Yes. Uh, Those of you who are familiar with One Stop English will know about our lesson share competition where we encourage teachers to submit their lesson ideas. If you win, your lesson will be professionally designed and edited uh, by our team and you can get a prize. You can win a Macmillan book for teachers. Yes. Yeah. When I was a teacher, I did that. I entered a competition at Macmillan. And uh, I wrote a lesson about uh, American English and British English, and I won a £50 Amazon voucher. Did you? Mm-hmm. What did you spend it on? Um, I can't quite remember, but I'm um, sure it was something very academic and uh, thought-provoking. Of course. All right, last <laughs> question this week is um, a bit more light-hearted. It is, if you could teach anywhere in the world, where would you teach and why? I think all of us have taught uh, somewhere abroad, but where would you go if you had a choice? Uh, I think I'd probably go to Japan because it's just such a fascinating place, so different from here. So I'd like to experience that. Right. Becca? Yeah, so so I did teach in Japan, and similarly, I'd like to go somewhere quite different right, from yeah, Japan as right. well. So maybe um, a country in South America would be really good. Patrick? Um, I think South America as well, actually, yeah. I taught in, uh, in the Far East. I taught in South Korea, and I would like to go to Argentina, I think. That would be my choice. Uh, great. And for listener reference, I'd like to go to Hawaii, <laughs> uh-huh. uh, mainly because I like surfing. So that would be a lot of fun. <laughs> well, that's it for our first show. If you have any questions, suggestions or feedback, please email us at one stop podcast at macmillan.com. Thank you to this month's panellists. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and a big thank you to Rob for joining us this month. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you for listening. And until next month, this is the One Stop English Podcast.